Ladies and gentlemen, could I have your attention? Would uh, someone like to bring all the other people that are outside <laughs> come in? We were, we were supposed to start at 6.45, and I believe it's gone over that time. And we have some live streaming people sitting in their living rooms wondering where we are. So if we could get everyone together. <laughs> That's wonderful. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If anyone is wondering why I am standing here with a tie around my neck, it is because this is in honor of a late Roger Prentice, who was very much a part of CABF and who worked diligently with the committee to bring this whole uh, weekend together. So in honor of Roger, I will be wearing a tie. If any of you have one of his ties, um, don't be afraid to wear it. Tomorrow is a wonderful day to do that. Um, you want me to, I'll come out and show my tie. <laughs> Thank you. Oh dear. <laughs> First of all, uh, let me say good evening. And I do want to bring, uh, I just want to wish you all a very warm welcome. Whether you're sitting here in the pews or whether you're at home uh, sitting in your living room and you probably have a cup of coffee or tea and biscuits, we don't have any of those, so enjoy them. This weekend, this weekend we are celebrating, celebrating. That means we are excited, we're jubilant, and we are... Um, on fire because it has been seven, 50 years since those forward-thinking individuals gathered to share their wisdom and learn more about theological issues of the day as well as simply enjoying one another. They were people of like minds, male, female, pastors, clerk, um, pastors, lay people. It didn't matter. They got together and they began something that was powerful. And that was the birth of Atlantic Baptist Fellowship, now known as the Canadian Association for Baptist Freedoms. Before we begin the formal proceedings, there are just a few housekeeping items to cover. And of course, everybody likes to know where the washrooms are, so if you go out this front door, you'll find one, or you can go down the stairs at the back. On another note, if you are a member of CABF, there is going to be a special meeting on June the 16th at 7 p.m. It'll be a Zoom meeting, and an invitation will be sent to you to so that you can participate from home. Um, there are only a few items that must be dealt with, but they must be dealt with the membership. So we will um, put that uh, date in your calendar, in your brain, and um, we hope to see you then. So that's June 16th at 7 p.m. That's a Thursday. There, are The details of the items that we will be covering, uh, you will be able to find on, your, on the website, the Canadian uh, Association for Baptist Freedoms website. So... Following, and the other thing is that following tonight's session, there is a time of refreshments. You've already seen some of them out there, and we want to invite everyone to enjoy them. Yes, even you at home, if you want to come, you're welcome to come and enjoy the refreshments. Now, to begin our more serious component of this evening, we focus on our beginnings 50 years ago and pay tribute to a representative list of individuals who were strategically supportive of ABF and sadly are no longer physically with us. This will be a time of memories for many and a time of appreciation and respect for all of us. Following this presentation, which will be a video and you'll see it on the screen. Following this presentation, during a moment of silence and reflection, 
I will be down front and I will light this candle to signify that their work has brought light into our world and it will not be forgotten. This is a time to be grateful. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael and the PowerPoint video.
We now move into the historic element of our evening as Reverend Dr. Scott Kindred Barnes leads us into stories of the past. Scott is very active at CABF, editing the regular publication of the bulletin, as well as attending and contributing to our council meetings. He has degrees from Acadia University, as well as the University of Toronto. He taught in the historical department at Toronto School of Theology before serving as pastor of First Baptist Ottawa. We'd like to say at that point in time, he saw the light. And in 2018, he returned to Nova Scotia with his wife and two children, where he now serves as senior pastor of Woolfield Baptist Church. Let us welcome him and his message to us this evening. Thank you, Marlene. I uh, usually read an academic paper most years for the last 15 years, but it's in the Reformation. So it's uh, a little more intimidating to stand here when people can stand up and say, no, no, it wasn't like that, Scott. That doesn't happen with Calvin and Luther much. I, I start with that point because this isn't just the history that I'm getting from documents. This is your history. And so it is our history. And so I would welcome feedback as we talk and as I wrestle with uh, what this project uh, is turning into. It was in November 2005 when Roger Forsman suggested in a written note to the, the ABF executive that a proper history of the Atlantic Baptist Fellowship would be of great value to understanding the organization's role within Atlantic Baptist life and faith. Now, just prior to COVID-19, when uh, the CABF uh, approached me to take on this task, I was deeply honored, as I am this evening, to present to you some of my research thus far. I've completed a thorough review of the primary documents from the 1970s and continue to work my way through the 1980s and 1990s. And at this point, I have a more general sense of our history from the start of the new millennium on, but I continue to collect primary resources. So if you have anything at all, I'm pretty good with bulletins and the Atlantic Baptist now that the archives is open. But if you have anything else that you think might be rare, please, uh, please seek me out. So thank you. It is an honor to be here tonight to talk about um, our history on this special occasion marking 50 plus years since our foundation. I was two days old, two days old on September 15th, 1971, when an ad hoc meeting was held at the Anglican Diocesan Center in Halifax, at which plans were made for the organizational meeting of what would become known as the Atlantic Baptist Fellowship. Thanks to the summaries provided by uh, both Athena Culpitz and uh, Philip Griffin Allwood, we have a concise summary of the two motions that were passed at the 1971 annual convention at Mount Allison that led to the formation of the ABF. And if you have the handout, I did pass out the handout. You can take a look at that first quotation that's printed there by a majority of 61. The decision was made that no appointments were to be made by the United Baptist Convention of the Atlantic Provinces to the Canadian Council of Churches and that no funding, direct or indirect, would be made to the CCC. The second motion, adopted by a majority of 244, changed the constitution of the convention to read that churches could only appoint delegates that had been baptized by immersion. Again, that's on the, on the handout, and I think David is going around now. For those of you who are tuning in by live stream, that's been posted on the website as well. Now for us, nearly 51 years removed from the 1971 convention, we might wonder what all the fuss was about. But take what this latter motion, requiring delegates to be baptized by 
immersion only meant for churches like Sydney United Baptist, Wolfville United Baptist, First Baptist Halifax, First Baptist Amherst, just to name a few. Especially those churches who had members in good standing who had been baptized in other traditions. It meant that Christians deemed worthy to serve in the local fellowship could not represent them in their denominational life. I've seen what kind of pain that causes here in my own ministry where we have people, we have an open membership and we have people who were baptized in different traditions and we receive them into membership and we love them and we couldn't function without them and yet they cannot represent us in our own denominational life. I think as Winston Miles once put it in response to this particular 1970 one amendment. He said, I felt that I could almost interpret that action as an invitation to a, a church such as this, meaning Sydney Baptist, to get out. Surely, the more conservative elements within convention, for them, that would have been a favorable option. But thank God, there was the Atlantic Baptist Fellowship. Now, please know that the events uh, the events of 1971 have a long back history that my study in book form will aim to explain. In other words, to understand why the ABF was formed, one needs to look at length at some of the developments within convention and the wider ecumenical world from a period stretching from the late 1940s, so the post-war, up until the early 1970s. I do not have time, obviously, to do that tonight, we'd be here until next week if we went step by step. But I do plan to devote an entire chapter to those developments leading up to 1971 convention. But let me just briefly highlight what those involved, what that, what, what, what that history looks like. A growing distrust of the theological orientation of Acadia University by a segment of Atlantic Baptists largely from the more conservative evangelical pastors and churches of New Brunswick, and consequently a tendency for many pastors in the Maritimes to leave the Maritimes and receive theological education outside. The, the founding of the United Baptist Bible Training School in 1949, initially at the high school level, but then by the 1960s, the push to make it an accredited college. I'm not making any values on that tonight, but what I'm saying is it forms the backdrop leading up to 71. Now starting in the late 1940s, but ongoing through the 1950s and the 1960s, the question of whether the Baptist Federation of Canada ought to affiliate with the World Council of Churches. That's part of that history as well. And I think there's also the unresolved question and debate over what it means to be both evangelical, what it means to be ecumenical. There's also the unresolved question of the convention's relationship to mainline Protestantism. All these factors and more are part of the context leading up to the 1971 convention. So after the ad hoc meeting in Halifax in mid-September, the organizational meeting took place at First Baptist Church Truro in October, on October 14th, 1971, there were 47 people in attendance, and I know Dan was there because he told me earlier on. <laughs> so if you want to know the names of those folks who were there at the first meeting, talk to Dan. <laughs> he will remember more than I will. <laughs> A constitution was drawn up for the fellowship, and membership was extended to churches and individuals who have declared or registered themselves supporters of the aims of the fellowship. And I would draw your attention to the original purposes of the ABF on the handout, which has been printed. I don't have time this evening, obviously, to explore how these purposes have shaped the past 50 years of ABF, CABF life and work, but I think they all relate to how the pursuit of freedom has been understood, sought after, and shared by the organization over the past 50 plus years. We might question number five, which talks about the well-being and unity of the United Baptist Convention of Atlantic Provinces. We might ask what our role is since 
becoming the Canadian Association of Bapti for Baptist Freedoms in 2012. Now, Ed, earlier on, you stole a bit of my thunder by talking about freedom, but because I have a long talk, it's going to be helpful, so I'll just, I'll just cut that part. You already summarized that, that difficult word, freedom, especially in our context now with what's happened in Ottawa. In the Atlantic Baptist world, religious liberty relates to how our churches, our institutions, and individual members both, they view the church life and education. Such perspectives have implications for how education works at the local church level and in the training of our pastors. Long before the introduction of Bill 49 in the Nova Scotia legislature in 1966, when Acadia University was no longer subject to the guidelines of Baptists in the Maritimes, pressure was put upon Acadia's president, Watson Kirkconnell, by some United Baptists to have an all-Christian faculty in the university. This was problematic because he had Jews on staff in the faculty. And he raised that in the Halifax papers. What do I do with good standing faculty who happen to share a different conviction than, than our Baptist convention? So you can see liberty, of course, is important. This incident and, and, and the facts, I think, point to that there are various philosophies of education at work within the convention uh, leading up to 71. One philosophy encouraged and even celebrated indoctrination. The assumption behind the indoctrination view held that an institution is only Christian if it exists as an organ of the church, which not only has a truth to proclaim, but also has a duty to defend its message. To lose sight of such a philosophy, so goes the argument, is to derail the purpose of Christian education. That's the indoctrination view. And yet there is also an alternative philosophy of education held among some Atlantic Baptists, and I would say Canadian Baptists in general. Uh, some Canadian Baptists in general hold this view. This was grounded in the pursuit of truth regardless of religious and non-religious convictions. With this latter view, religious claims can and are part of this discourse, but like all other disciplines, theology must not have a privileged status other than what it earns. Furthermore, if Christians are to be taken seriously, states the latter position, then they must show the kind of intellectual and spiritual rigor that proves their mettle in the academy, in the academy and in the public sphere. But more importantly, even essential to this latter position is the Baptist principle that honors the freedom of conscience for those to pursue truth as they understand it, rather than dictate what is acceptable, the acceptable parameters of belief. This latter view argues that Christians are to be free to pursue, study, and believe as conscience dictates. One of the central focuses of the ABF, the CABF, over the past 50 years has been to foster a philosophy that honors and celebrates the pursuit of truth while refuting the philosophy of indoctrination. That comes across in numerous publications of the Bulletin, which has served as one of the central educational platforms uh, for the organization as we have continually tried to share the message. It comes across in the various messages by many speakers who have been invited to share their wisdom, both at the spring and the fall meetings in what we now call the Vince Rushton Memorial Lectures. From its inception in 1971, in making a stand for religious liberty and freedom over indoctrination, the ABF has often been misunderstood. Within weeks of sending out letters to the convention churches and publishing information in the Atlantic Baptist, a stream of letters came back to Kendall Kenny, Kendall Kenny, who was acting as the temporary chairman of the ABF in the early months. Many of these letters were highly critical of the Atlantic Baptist Fellowship and accused the fellowship of creating divisiveness among Atlantic United Baptist churches. 
Thereafter, the fellowship was very careful to emphasize its intended purposes, including the promotion and well-being of the United Baptist Convention of the Atlantic Provinces. A note published in the July 1st, 1972 edition of the Atlantic Baptist reads as follows. The real spirit which the fellowship wishes to foster is that of cooperation between various points of view to try to prevent factionalism and to encourage a healing ministry among the, ch among the churches. Fear of division had become a reality long before the formation of the Atlantic Baptist Fellowship. When, a certain, when certain interest groups had attempted to sway convention to the theologic, theologically to the right or to push those they deemed liberal, liberal out of the convention. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the concerned pastors because that's, that's uh, what they uh, called themselves. Uh, and they met as early as 1969 in the spring, and they, they drew together four uh, points of protest in order to send to the convention executive to try to um, uh, sway convention life. And one of, it's their fourth point that is relevant to our discussion tonight. They, uh, they wanted the convention to withdraw from the Canadian Council of Churches because of its desire to involve Roman Catholics. Now, a notice of motion was uh, given at the 1970 Convention Assembly that the Atlantic United Baptist Convention sever its relations uh, with the Canadian Council of Churches and it was to be voted on at the 1971 Convention. Behind this motion, this group that called themselves the Concerned Pastors worked to have significant influence over the final vote. At the 1971 convention, delegates and observers attending the assembly were handed literature drawn up by the concerned pastors, giving the impression that the material was part of the regular program. It was not. Instead, it was a surprise tactic presented to delegates to help instill fear and to help um, uh, to sway the vote, really. If this booklet, and this is, some may debate how influential it was, but if this booklet did not sway the vote, it certainly did not help those who were defending that we continue our affiliation with the Canadian Council of Churches. The document that I'm talking about is called the United Baptist Convention and the Canadian Council of Churches, a study of the relationship distributed by the concerned pastors of the convention, August 1971. Hereafter, I'll call it a study of relationship. This document gave the appearance of an informed assessment of the ecumenical movement, the Canadian Council of Churches, and the World Council of Churches, but a closer look reveals that it was poorly researched. A study of relationship is more accurately a polemical work where the concerned pastors picked up on the convention's executives, the convention executive's recommendation to first read a report due to be published by the Anglican Church of Canada before it reached its decision. A task force from the Anglican Church had been put in place following a resolution passed at the General Synod of 1969, which recognized the increasing role played by the CCC in Canadian church life. Specifically, the resolution called for a study of the relationship between the Anglican church. The concerned pastors, they picked up on this and used it as polemical fodder to push forward a hasty decision in favor of withdrawing from the CCC. No one in convention executive was suggesting for a minute that Atlantic Baptists leave this important decision to the Anglican Church of Canada. But good common sense required that they at least read the, what the Anglican task force had recommended to their own people before making a hasty decision. In fact, both the Presbyterian Church of Canada and the Salvation Army took time to read the report and responded to it. However, the concerned pastors played on the fears of their fellow Atlantic Baptists, many of whom had, were already suspicious 
of what the ecumenical movement, especially its push towards a visible unity, meant for autonomous Baptist churches. A stu a, the study of relationships document played on the fear with the question, are Atlantic Baptists going to be governed in their autonomous decisions by what the Anglican Church does or may wish to do? I apologize to any Anglicans who are here. There is considerable irony in the fact that one of the central recommendations from the Anglican Task Force was that the old institutional style of ecumenism at work in the CCC be replaced with a coalition model where autonomous groups, autonomous groups, or churches cooperate on particular projects, contribute their fair share towards staff and budget of each one they choose, and are quite free to opt out when they choose. And while the coalition model was rejected by the Salvation, on, Salvation Army on grounds that they believed that the CCC needed a more simple structure, most Baptists, I suspect, would have supported the voluntary nature of such proposals by the task force. The executive's uh, suggestions or recommendations were not followed, and we know the history, at least, where the vote went. Doug Moffat was uh, at the 1971 convention. He was reporting on behalf of the denominational magazine, The Atlantic Baptist, and while at the convention, he talked with Dan Gibson, who relayed the fact that he had just been turned away from a meeting held by the concerned pastors. In mid-September 1971, Moffat reported on the convention, that, that 71 convention in the Atlantic Baptist. This is what he writes. The booklet, referring to the study of relationship by the concerned pastors, was prepared and distributed by a group that calls itself the Concerned Pastors of Convention, a euphemism, a euphemism that gives no indication as to who they are or how they differ from those of us who apparently are not, or for those who are apparently unconcerned. This reporter learned that membership in the group is restricted and meetings are closed. It is difficult to determine just how influential the booklet was in molding opinion, but the prolonged debate on the floor certainly reflected many of the assertions made in the publication. Consequently, on November 1st, 1971, the concerned pastors published a rebuke in a letter to the editor in the Atlantic Baptist, proclaiming that they were neither a closed society, nor did they wish to imply that they are the only people concerned about convention. In, in an effort of full disclosure, 39 names are listed beneath the letter, and I've included those names since they've been published in the handout. Now, a series of meetings took place uh, in June 1972 between convention exec the convention executive reps from the ABF and those representing the Association of Evangelical Baptists. Now, even though many of the same people in the Association of Evangelical Baptists were also concerned pastors, it was not until August of that same year that the two groups formally merged, forming what they called the Evangelical Baptist Fellowship that was in direct response to the success of the Atlantic Baptist Fellowship. I don't have time tonight to report the heated debates that unfolded when the ABF reps met with convention and the Association of Evangelical Baptists, but the minutes speak for themselves about the drama that unfolded. I'm gonna read directly from the minutes. The executive denied flatly the existence of such a group, meaning the concerned pastors. The General Secretary, Keith Hobson, said that he had no first-hand knowledge of such a group, that such a group was holding closed meetings at convention. Dean Henniger then stated that at least one person had been thrown out of such a meeting, to which both Hobson and Sam Baxter responded that they had heard this, but that it must be regarded as hearsay, as neither were pre present themselves. At this point, Henniger brought it to everyone's attention 
that the person in question was present here today. Should anyone still doubt the veracity of the claim, the person in question was Daniel Gibson, the, the secretary who recorded the very minutes that I'm reading. <laughs> this is what he says. This is how you ended the minutes, Dan. You said, it was admitted then that a pressure group does exist and that it holds closed and secret meetings. And so there you are. You've got a small taste of what our history will read like uh, in the 1970s, and I hope to be as equally thorough and detailed in the remaining four de uh, decades as well. But I also want to show, in the time remaining, how the past 50 years has been a story of multiple other themes as well. I, I think one of the themes that I want to stress and continue researching is the history of the CB CABF is a story of growing concerns for women's voices in the church. If you look at the handout and read the names of the officers serving at the 1972 meeting, you will see that the women officers are not named by their first names, but by the names of their husbands. I'm happy to report that the ABF minutes throughout the 1970s show that this practice gradually faded, faded away. Moreover, the 1980s saw a gradual shift in the ABF's engagement with women's rights. No doubt this reflects some of the cultural shifts that are going on at the time. One group of academic feminists writes that the 10 years between 1978 and 1988, they describe it as a decade of feminist resistance and defined feminist ethics as a system and process of personal and political priorities and values that have mer emerged from women's experiences of oppression. And yet, Atlantic Baptist life was hardly that of the Women's Study International Forum, I know that. When Michael Leip concluded his tenure as the editor of the Atlantic Baptist in 1997, he was rightly commended for featuring a number of special issues on pertinent topics, including women in ministry. But as with many topics explored and debated in convention, the ABF had given a platform long before this went to print. On Saturday, November 1st, 1980, at Lawrencetown, Nova Scotia, the ABF hosted the Right Reverend Dr. Lois Wilson, who was then the immediate past president of the Canadian Council of Churches and the recently elected moderator of the United Church of Canada. This was an important symbol of openness, not only to women's ordination, but a sign of genuine respect for a Christian leader who had much to contribute to the Canadian church life. And yet from the perspective of some conservatives, many of which who were against women or women's ordination and the United Church in general, hosting such a speaker as Wilson was just one more point of evidence to show that we were a bunch of liberals. Regardless, by 1985, the Reverend Diane McVicker was invited to speak to the ABF on the role of women in the church. This was two years before the notice of motion in, intended to prevent women from being ordained was presented at assembly of the United Baptist Convention. Thank God it was defeated. I like to think that the ABF did have something to do with that final vote. I think the uh, history of the CABF is also a story of standing up for freedom and liberty. What might a history of the CABF add to our understanding of the Canadian Baptist memory and experience? Well, if nothing else, I hope it can add more nuance and both fill in some of the gaps in the historiography, and while also offering a fresh perspective on the rather complicated, even messy Atlantic Baptist world and identity, as well as the larger Canadian Baptist world and identity. Recently, Gordon Heath, Dallas Free 
Friesen and Taylor Murray have published a much needed book titled Baptists in Canada, Their History and Polity. Their book replaces the rather dated, in my view, problematic treatment of Canadian Baptist history by Harry Renfrey. It was Robert S. Wilson who identified the turbulent 60s as the closest that the Atlantic uh, Convention ever came to divisive fundamentalism. Heath et al. cite Wilson and then go on to suggest that the ABF and the CABF was a group of progressive pastors which prioritized ecumenical dialogue. This is far too simple a description. Not only does this neglect the fact that many of the big players in the ABF were and still are laity, including the first three presidents, Kendall Kenny, Jack Matthews, Ed Cahoon, Numerous others in leadership can be mentioned as well, including Winston Miles, Hope Kirkconnell, Dr. Dorothy Lovesey, Dr. Marion Grant, to name but a few from the early years. But it also reduces the ABF to a mere protest group with, without taking seriously what the fellowship sought to do within convention and the wider ecumenical fellowship. I might add Evelyn Smith, Isabel Horton, Paul Burden, Elaine Ann McGregor, Lee Nicholas Patillo, David and Joyce Allen, Susan Cahoon, Martin Waugh, Jim and Sheila Stanley, and the list goes on of lay representatives and workers within the CABF and the Atlantic Baptist Fellowship. The idea that the ABF was a mere ecumenical protest group led by liberal clergy was promoted, it needs to be said, by the earliest opposition of those within convention. And that is still with us in the historiography. It needs to be corrected. And if there's one thing I do, <laughs> I have to do that. I have to correct that historiography or at least challenge it. A history of the CABF is also a story of lived ecumenism. Ecumenism was and has remained one of the priorities of the CABF as Drs. Morris and Dorothy Lovesey, the Reverend John Boyd, Evelyn Smith and others made sure through their good work, uh, through the good work of the Atlantic Ecumenical Council. And from very early on the ABF supported the Canadian Girls in Training Program and other ecumenical camps while Dr. Roger Kahn provided ecumenical models for the local church in talks and then subsequent, subsequently in many, or I, at least two uh, bulletin articles. Yes, we devoted an entire assembly to the World Council of Churches publication, Baptism, Eucharist and Ministry, or BEM document. Some Baptists chose to ignore the BEM document even though it has proven to be the most widely distributed, translated, and discussed ecumenical text of modern times. So kudos to us for embracing that and wrestling with it, and not always agreeing with it, but at least taking seriously what the wider ecumenical world is saying about baptism. The CABF is nothing if it is not ecumenical. But we need not ignore the good work done in promotion of the historic Baptist principles, Christian education, biblical interpretation, church history, social justice, and the explicitly stated and repeated objective of strengthening the United Baptist Convention. The ABF newsletter, now known as simply the Bulletin, had a lengthy period in which it was published quarterly. It had and has had readers of all theological stripes read it. In October 1976, when the recently retired Acadia University chaplain, the Reverend Judd Levy, became editor of the ABF, what was, it was called the ABF Quarterly Bulletin at the time, the publication on which up until that point had largely been a, a, a pamphlet for disseminating news and updates, it became more of an open forum where ideas were discussed and thought about and wrestled with. And uh, Judd poured 
I think he was there for nine years as the editor. He poured himself into that to be able to speak and to talk about issues that today, unfortunately, may, people are maybe just not even willing to talk about, but at least we are here at the CABF. Now, there's a question of how influential was the Atlantic Baptist Fellowship and the CABF on other Baptist churches? Well, I was looking through that and I, and I, I thought, in addition to the bulletin, the ABF's desire to educate Atlantic Baptists and to encourage thoughtful discourse about pressing issues of the 1970s resulted in the publications, Discovery from Discussion, and, and J.R.C. Perkins' excellent little book that I've, I've lent to people even today. It's an excellent little book. It's called Scripture Then and Now. And while the ABF's Theological Commission, which was put together in the 70s, it, it put together a, a fairly well, it's a, it's a dense piece of theological work on the nature of theology. Uh, unfortunately, it petered out towards the end of the 70s, but it was at least made an effort. We do know that Perkins' uh, book, Scripture Then and Now, was quoted antagonistically at length in a letter sent out uh, to convention churches by Main Street Baptists in Sackville, New Brunswick in 1978. We quote from the booklet, says this public letter, simply to show how much unbelief is tolerated in our once fundamental convention." End quote. How's my time? Am I well over my time, or you want me to sum up? <laughs> okay, so I got a few minutes, okay. 50 years and a half an hour, come on. <laughs> uh, I haven't even got out of the 70s yet, so. Um, I, I, I'm going to go to I'm going to go to another point because we are getting long. The history of the CABF is a story of questioning who we are and what our role is as Baptist Christians in the wider church and in our world. Paul Burden, upon becoming the president of the ABF in 1998, he was told by a naysayer that the ABF is just a bunch of intellectuals. Ten years later, President David Ogilvy, the first presidential speech that he gave, he said, our attendance at our events is declining and subscription list to the bulletin is shrinking. Not terribly optimistic. We know that in 2008, First Baptist Church Truro had a congregational vote under the direction of Pastor Andy Kroll. The vote focused on the question of same-sex marriage and the use of the facilities for the same. Truro, I think, did the right thing by wanting to respond to a letter from convention saying that churches needed to establish a policy for themselves regardless of resolution and regulations of convention on this matter. Truro discern through the local fellowship what their stance was going to be on that. The congregation voted narrowly in favor of traditional marriage. But the ABF was there to support that group should they decide locally to move in a different direction. Which leads me to conclude not only our influence over the past 50 years, but also to question the influence of the CABF going forward. The old ABF that since 2012 was incorporated under the new name, the Canadian Association for Baptist Freedoms, now offers accreditation to ministers. And so I've been asking myself as we seek to share our important struggle for liberty, but also to share some of the history. Who exactly are we? are we? Are we a new Baptist denomination? What is our relationship to the CBAC? Or what is our relationship to the wider Canadian Baptist ministries and conventions in general? Now that churches in Ontario and in Alberta 
have affiliated with us. Perhaps going forward, we need to look at ourselves and ask how we today might follow the Spirit's leading to be a resource to other Baptist Christians and the wider ecumenical world as a whole. These questions, I'm sure, are going to emerge as we discuss uh, during about what the present and the future look like tomorrow. So thank you for bearing with me tonight. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. I, I cut it back a lot. I tried to. Oh, well, I'm, I'm so grateful. I want to uh, just uh, in a brief way express our gratitude to you, Scott, for this. We can tell this is the beginning of, of uh, you revealing the research that you're pulling together and it, we're so grateful will be a book. And uh, so I decided I'm not going to take notes tonight. I'll wait for that book. Anyway, you might be waiting a bit. I won't ask you when, when the book is, but we thank you so much, Scott, for your ongoing work and for your presentation of this part of it tonight. And I heard some, some of the history that I'd certainly never heard about before, some detailed stuff that, I, you know, not being a historian, it's like I'm getting drawn into this more and more as my, the years go by and certainly into tonight. Let's take about 13, 14 minutes just for some uh, conversation, for some questions or responses. I think there are microphones here for the use of people uh, who want to speak. And if you can't make it to the microphone, maybe you can make your question extraordinarily brief so that it can be repeated so everyone can hear it, or, or your comment for that matter. So. What would anyone like to say or ask more about? I see John Churchill's waving excitedly. I have two questions. Are you aware of the Wentworth statement? And what significance should she have? And the second one is to get you to answer your own question. Are we in the nomination? Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, the Wentworth statement uh, is part of the current historiography. So the Wentworth Statement was uh, in 71, in the fall of 71, when some of these groups were emerging and a lot of politics were going on. A group of pastors, I can't remember exactly how many they are, but I have, I have all the documentation. Uh, they met in Wentworth Valley and they came up with the Wentworth Statement. They published it in the Atlantic Baptist. Now, some have argued that the Wentworth Statement saved us from a break. But at least one of those pastors, John Barthall, who signed the Wentworth Statement, if you read it, it's a very, I'd say it's a conservative, moderate statement. It's nothing, there's nothing liberal about it. John Barthall was taken to task for signing that and had to defend himself for signing it. So what I think that shows is that there are various forms of what we call middle ways, via medias, where people are trying to, to carve a middle way between what they regard as extremes. But I think often that view says the terms that people draw in pulling their moderation reveals more about the person trying to be moderate than it does the extremes that they're reacting to. I don't think the Wentworth statement saved us from a split. I think the CABF had a strong place in allowing those who did not want to move to the right, allowing a place for us to hang our hats. So I, I, think, I think the CA, the ABF and what now is CABF has an important role in, in the historiography and looking at our history of, of convention. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, Rusty said something to me earlier on that I really liked. And Rusty, can you remind me again, it's called Denomin Network. And that's a term I kind of like, you know, denominate network. It's connected because it's an association, and associations have voluntary membership, and so people choose to affiliate with us. I like that. I, I don't know, uh, you had mentioned the person, but I, I really do like that. So um, th that's how I think that makes sense right now. But my question is, do we have a role within the wider Baptist world, but also ecumenical world to, to speak. And I know we're part of the Canadian Council of Churches, which convention has not moved beyond a, an observer since 71. 
Uh, we are part of that conversation to uh, present our Baptist presence from the Atlantic Canada and now Canadian Baptist life, um, but we're also there to listen and to learn and to teach. So we, there's a two-way street. We need to be part of that conversation. Now, I'm biased. I was on the Canadian Council of Churches for, for about six years and loved it, and, uh, and, and I think it's very, very important. It represents... I think roughly 73% of Christians in Canada. Now, I know stats are always difficult, but that's 73% diff 73 of Christians in Canada are represented on the Canadian Council of Churches. We should be part of that, and I'm glad that the CABF is. So, does that answer, John? Yeah, thanks. Eric. As ministry continues to get more messy in a world that no longer has, I'll say it, Christendom to rely on. And what I mean by Christendom are Christian values of society determined by the church or, or values that are determined by the church. As Christendom has passed, I think we all would agree that Christendom for the most part has, has passed. Church life gets more messy, and that is where the autonomy of the local church is so important. Because, Eric, if you and I have important positions of power, and we decide that the rest of these folks need to see it our way, then that's an abuse of power. It can be, at least, if we're not listening to the voice of the body of Christ. And so that's where I think it's important to celebrate and to uh, affirm the local, uh, the authority of the local church. Now the ministry here in Wolfville is not going to be the same as the Wolfville Ridge, for instance, maybe. Or maybe it's not going to look the same as in Canaan. Or as we go out across the country, and it doesn't have to be. But that local body of churches, or the local church, decides that, I think. Um, what their ministry looks like. That's, that's what I would, that, that's what I think is relevant as the world continues to change. Um, we have something important to share and to give. So thank you for that. Was there another question on that? I, uh, Carol, Anne. <laughs> okay, Anne with an E. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Sure. About the uh, primacy and importance of the autonomy of the local church. Yep. As I look out over the world, the global mm. Christian world, I see uh, much more emphasis on the local church and its in in certain certainly in evangelical mm. Christian life. Okay. Where That's, that's where the association can be helpful. Um, I think, I think it's, a, it's always a tension between the autonomy and, and the association in that regard because the association is not necessarily affirming everything that's done on the local church level. I don't think it can, um, and yet it's probably not its place, but that's a really good question. Um, I guess I guess the issue is is to avoid coercion of those who are trying to respond to the spirit, um, whatever that 
wherever that direction takes us. Um, and sometimes that's dynamic and, and, and difficult to discern. It's that messy spot that sometimes makes us uncomfortable. But um, Can you think of a specific example like of unorthodoxy? Like uh, sacrificing chickens or, or something like that? <laughs> Okay, well. I, I think that these mega churches yeah. in North America and, well, not just in North America, around the world, mm. and, well, to name a name, to say Joel Olson yeah. and his prosperity gospel, yeah. you know, the, the autonomy of that church mm. and then the, the power of mm. that. See, I, I, I wouldn't want to see coercion used for that, but I think there are other ways to combat it. And, yes, and well, I, part of that is through, um, through literature, through conferences, through education, uh, through preaching. What, what's that um, Gilead, uh, the novel where the pastor laments? He's been trying to teach Karl Barth for I don't know how many decades and he says one televangelist comes in and blows all the theology out the window. So we're competing against a difficult world, that's for sure. But, um, but I think that's why the CABF is important to have those discussions uh, to inform both laity and clergy. Um, I, I don't listen to that particular preacher, so I probably shouldn't respond. But, uh, but I know. They fill stadiums, <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah. And I, w- I would argue then that that is a reason for the CABF to exist. So the yeah. So okay. it isn't reduced to just hmm. the economy. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. Yeah, um, for sure. Yes. Caroline's challenge has got me thinking. Uh, I, I, I'm still. Uh, rolling uh, Ed's ideas around my head about Ivan Illich. He talked about the corruption of the best is the worst. Mm. You know, talked about the uh, corruption of the gospel in the early church Mm -hmm. led to an unprecedented experience of evil in the world. That was Mm. Ivan, that's what got Ivan Illich in in trouble with the Vatican, right? Mm. But I heard on the news the other day that the diocese of the Roman Catholic Diocese in Newfoundland is selling off all their buildings because a Supreme Court decision has meant that they owe uh, tens of millions of dollars to the victims of the Mount Cashel, um, um, you know, uh, mm. tragedy going yeah. back forty years, you know. Um, and they interviewed a, a, a Roman Catholic priest who is now living at home in his parents' basement, basically saying, you know, um, if I have to celebrate the Eucharist in the garage, Mm. our community will get together. The Roman Catholic Church, this, you know, significant Mm. force for Christianity in the world is facing a reckoning, you know. I think it's happening in many places. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the one of the moves that has happened in the Roman Catholic world in Canada in recent years has been a, a kind of a, 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 a fragmenting uh, around liability issues, you know, to smaller and smaller groups. So they hold less and less liability, right? So, you know, in that kind of a situation, uh, in that, you know, with a kind of a reckoning, it seems to me that there is a, a reckoning with power and 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 control in these highly centralized structures, hmm. you know. And you know, it seems to me that maybe an organization like the CABF is is coming from a very different place, right? I don't hmm. know whether you'd want to comment. I, th- I think I think we're coming from from the bottom up as opposed to the top down, yeah. and. You know, in the Canadian Council of Churches, I used to say we're Congregationalists, which is both a blessing and a curse. I mean, it, it's a blessing in that, that we can discern locally what our mission should look like, 
but it can be a curse trying to get everybody on the same page, <laughs> you know, to do something. I mean, it's a, that, that's a difficult difficulty that we face in those tensions. I'm sure. I'm sure there are there are tensions with the other, uh, with the other, with episcopacy as well. I mean, it's there's something inherent when someone has power over others that abuse can happen. It happens in Baptist churches too, doesn't it? Uh, and so this is one of the things I think we need to have more of a discussion about. What is Constantinianism? Um, people will talk about Constantinianism and think that it is about the Emperor Constantine in the fourth century. Not, not according to the literature. Constantinianism is deeper than that. You can have Constantinianism within a local fellowship where some are trying to lord over others and use their power to, for abuse or whatever it is. Um, Constantinianism is something that we need to be constantly challenging ourselves on. And there's some good literature on that. But um, I used to, th and, and I think early Baptists had an idea. Um, see, the early Baptists were primitivists. And what they meant, what they meant by that is, is they, they read their Bible, and anything that they didn't see um, in the Bible was questioned was subject to question. So what they wanted to do is to jump back to the apostle, the apostolic age, to what they believed was the pure age. Well, there are some things that come into the church, the doctrine of the Trinity, for instance. Do we want to throw that out? No, they didn't. At least many didn't. Um, but, but with that impulse, it has its challenges to try to get back to uh, the pure church. And uh, I, I think we, we run into that sometimes um, in, in our Baptist world. You know, well, the scripture says this, and we got to, you know, as if there's no distance between, <laughs> between 2,000 years ago and today. And uh, that's, um, I'm wandering again. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> did I answer your question or try to? <laughs> I think. Yeah, we can talk again over coffee. <laughs> uh, any other thoughts? Maybe this could be the last one. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, you're talking about Baptist history and identity. Yeah. Uh, I'm sitting here thinking of Thomas Helwig's, yeah. and John Smythe, and the Angus Library of Regent Park College yeah. at Oxford. And yeah. I'm wondering if we can go back further, uh, 300 years to the 1600s. Yeah. And and read uh, with real. Relish and appreciation mm. the identity of Baptists as they broke away from the the um, Anglican Church of the day and discovered their own identity and yeah. they flee to Holland uh, for a while and then come back and, and Thomas Elwig uh, and, and others were persecuted and, mm. and lost their lives because of their stand for freedom yep. freedom from the authority of the king or the bishops or the authorities of the day. So I'm, I'm just trying to encourage uh, us to think back further mm -hmm. to where we came from as Baptists in uh, jolly old England. Yeah, I, I think that's part of the story as well. Um, the, but I would add to that, Hedley, and I think you have a Regent's Park tie on, don't you? Right now? I think so. Anyway, that's kudos. <laughs> um, but I, I think we need to be careful of not pulling... I, 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 I was at a Calvin conference one time on, on the 500th anniversary of Calvin, and, and a man stood up and said, I went to Calvin Elementary, I went to Calvin High School, I went to Calvin College. I love Calvin. And so whatever Calvin said, he pulled out of context and just applied it willy-nilly to today. I think we can run into that as well without context. I mean, Hellwist, for instance, um, he's not an ecumenical thinker. In fact, he the stakes were pretty high, and he ended up dying in prison. Um, so we understand his convictions, but he, according to him, he, he thought the Church of England was the second beast of Revelation. The first re beast of Revelation was Roman Catholicism. So, and I know you're not going there, but, but we still need to discern and wrestle with these individuals and their fallibility, but they're still part of our, 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 um, our history. Um, when I was in Toronto School of Theology, I taught a course on 
martyrdom in early modern England. And what I had is I had students from Catholic, Protestant, and I had Anabaptists and a variety of students. And I taught all three martyrological traditions. I taught Catholic, Protestant, and Anabaptist traditions. And so everybody came into the course with their celebrated martyrs. And my goal as we wrestled with these martyrs was to be able to see and celebrate the martyrs in other traditions. And uh, that's, that's where the ecumenism factored in. So that, that's, that's where I would be coming from. And I know you've written on ecumenism. I've seen your articles in the Atlantic Baptists and elsewhere. So <laughs> thank you for your question. <laughs> thank you for everyone for, for bearing. Thanks. Thank you so much again, Scott, for, uh, for the breadth of knowledge and thinking and, uh, and your breadth of perspective about all these issues that are raised that you bring to us tonight. And thank you also for being our host pastor here today. Thank you. We're going next door, to the, the speaker, he's the first one wondering, are we going next door for refreshments, which is right through here, and I don't know if you need to give us some instructions about how to get yeah, through the we'll doors. open these doors, but you can go, the washrooms are here, you can go this way, that way, or we're going to go through the center. Just okay. Where Dan is sitting. Yeah. So, gracious fellowship time with some refreshments next door, and uh, do tune again, in again tomorrow. We begin at, uh, after your registration, if you need to do that, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. Uh, Atlantic time. <laughs>